Ciao Milanisti and welcome back. And yes, this is the new, this is the new shirt for next season. This is the 2022-2023 official Milan shirt, authentic one. We'll be talking about that later on because obviously there's a bit of, uh, fans are a bit slightly disappointed um, from the outcome of this shirt, not due to the how it looks, it's more down to the materials and being surprised on uh, the materials used to make the shirt. We'll, we'll talk about it later on. I'll compare it to previous season's replica tops and uh, really go from there. But firstly, I want to talk about a few things about what's happening at the squad right now in the transfer market. Obviously, we signed Diva Corrigi. That's the first com uh, person coming into the club. There's a new signing. Uh, Pobega and Yassi Nadli have come back from their respective loan deals from Bordeaux and uh, Torino. Uh, players going out. Look, we know the Milan squad was quite big last season when it came down to looking at players that are, uh, you know, unnecessary, unnecessary to requirements. Um, you know, so, so Paolo Maldini has worked hard for him by reducing the clutter, I would call it, in the squad. The likes of Samuel Castillo's, Timo Bakayoko's, and, and he's doing quite a good job at it. You know, he's nearly there. I'll say he's about 90% there. So I'm going to quickly go across the players who have left the squad this summer and hopefully that makes room financially on the books on salary wise and also uh, transfer fee wise for us to make some good movements when it comes to player signings this summer. So the first two major departures would have to be Frank Kessi and Alessio Romagnoli who obviously go on a free contract um, respectively to Barcelona and Lazio. You know I said Kessi was near enough done it was a question of when Barcelona can sort of uh, put the contract through due to their financial restrictions that they're consistently under. And that's it. That's happened now. He's officially a Barcelona player, so we wish him all the best. Same with uh, Alessio Romagnoli, even though there was a bit of doubt whether he was going to go to Lazio, potentially to Fulham in the Premier League. He ends up going to his boyhood club, Lazio. So, you know, we wish him all the best as well. Romagnoli, you know, I'll talk about him a little bit longer than Kessie, just because he's been at the club longer. He was our captain. I've got a lot of love and a lot of respect for Romagnoli. Look, this was the best decision for his career. He had to put his career at, you know, at the, for the forefront of his mind. I wish he could have stayed, but you know, realistically, you're going to pay that money for a person who's going to be your fourth choice centre-back, someone who is in his prime right now. But, you know, I'm, I'm happy with it. I'm happy with it. We, we sort of, it's the right time to end it. It's the right time to sort of go our separate ways. And I wish him all the best to last year. And I, I think it's a good sight. That's a good move for him. And hopefully he can get back into the Italy squad, whatever it may be, because we just got to have a lot of love for a guy there. Um, and I'm just happy that his cycle at Milan sort of come to a close with him lifting the Scudetto last season. So really happy for him and got to thank him for his service. And the same goes, of course, for Frank Kessie as well. We've also finally shifted Leo Duarte. Um, he's gone to Turkey to uh, Bazak Sakir. Sahir? Bazak Sahir. I can't even pronounce that. I'm not Turkish, unfortunately. <laughs> even though I might look it. Um, he's gone to a Turkish side for around 2 million euros. Um, apparently, there is also a 40% sell on uh, clause. So, obviously, if he's sold on by that Turkish side to another club, we get 40% of the, uh, the transfer fee. So, who knows? There might be some future money waiting for us there. Very similar to as we've seen, uh, like Lucas Paqueta as well, if he makes a move from Lyon. It's good to have that fleshed in. I think it's something that we've not really done in previous management where we just sort of let a player go and, you know, even on terms that aren't even like favourable for us and not even incorporated on the selling fees because, you know, this is something that's quite common in football now. You have to look towards the future and even these little one, two, three, four, five millions ons that you get on from a future sale is handy when it comes to just anything really because we're a club who was obviously always looking to sort of financially make some sort of uh, benefits in our squad. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, it's, a, it's, a good, it's good to get him off the books financially as well. And, you know, hopefully this is sort of coming to a close, that era when Leonardo was running operations from a transfer market perspective and, and, and signing players like Leo Duarte and like Gonzalo Higuain and stuff like that. So that's coming to a close. We're now looking at the squad that only Paolo Maldini has built since his time there, you know, 2020 and onwards. So, um, you know, this is it. These, these players leaving is for the best. And another one from that era as well is Samuel Castillo, who goes on the free transfer to Valencia. But linking up again with uh, Gennaro Gattuso as head coach there. He goes on a free, so obviously he's not claiming anything back with his last year remaining from Milan. It's really not... Well, that's, that's fortunate of him. Um, I think it was for the best of him as well. I think he's going to wait around for another year or expecting to get paid for that last year. And... Because of that, Valencia don't have to pay any fees. So, um, you know, we're happy to get the salary off the books. But I do believe there are some sort of bonuses incorporated due to his performances. So if he does succeed there at Valencia, um, maybe if they have some, like, good performances finishing in the top four, we're going to get some sort of money from that as well. So it's good to get 
you know, Castillo and Duarte's salaries off the books and sort of close a chapter from that really uh, tragic transfer window. Now, those are the players who have gone outright. Now, it's time to look at the, quickly the players who've gone on loan deals. And they're quite a lot. Obviously, there's a, there's a range of players we have who are need experience. Um, players that we still can't shift as well, like Matia Caldara, which we'll come on to. Um, and it's mainly just the younger players who need that experience. And you're going to see a common theme where we're doing a loan deal with the right to buy, but also incorporating the buyback clause, which is, I'll come on to that being very intelligent in today's market football. Um, but if we quickly run through him now, um, Colombo's got a, another loan deal to Lecce, who are obviously in Serie A. He's already started preseason really well with, um, I think, two back-to-back -back braces in preseason friendly. So hopefully he gets that sort of uh, trajectory and uh, moving forward in his career. Um, Nasty, the uh, Primavera striker, has got a loan deal. I think it's near enough done to Cosa um, I think that, yeah, they're in Serie B. So that's a decent move for him, very similar to what Colombo had last season. So wish him all the best, get that experience. Um, Mattia Caldara, we have to loan him out to Spezia because um, it's just, we're not finding a club who is willing to buy him outright. And even though his, low, his deal was set to expire at the end of next season, I think behind the scenes, we've agreed a contract, a small contract extension for another year. Uh, he signed that to obviously get himself a loan to Spezia with the, obviously the right to buy at the end of the season. So hopefully this is the move that gets him um, a move uh, you know, away from us full time. And not, we don't have to sort of expect to see him back next summer and go for the whole scenario over again. Uh, Daniel Maldini is close to a loan move to Hellas Verona. Another one. Valuable experience. Serie A. It's hard to see really where he breaks into that first team just due to the fact that um, you know they, they're a decent side. Um, and it's just hard to see where he's going to pop into that position, Barak there, etc. So hopefully he gets some, you know, decent appearances, decent minutes, enough to really elevate himself and under some good coaching at that club, he might just really do well there. Um, Frank Chajout, I can't, I can never pronounce this guy's name. Sajout, Sajout has gotten a, a loan move to Cremonese, another Serie A club. So we're kind of hitting up the recently promoted sides. Um, so another one, you know, I think last season he was out on loan at Ascoli. Did okay there, so he's getting another sort of loan move in a sense. Right to buy with a right to buy back as well, you know, really good. And then most recently, Roback is getting a loan move to a Swiss side called uh, St. Gallen. I don't know how to pronounce them. Anyway, if we break them all down, really good because they're not really developing here at Milan. They're not going to get those minutes. We're, you know, hopefully scaling up as a club not really reliant on having to sort of, uh, we, we plugged a few holes last season by letting Maldini get those appearances. But I just feel like it's a bridge too far next season if we're really going to make that step up. It was good at the moment, but really we're going to really excel. Adley comes back on loan, hopefully make some signings like CDK will come on to shortly. We, we need to move on. We need to upscale this. And at the same time, let these players, these young players go out and get some valuable minutes some valuable experience and then we, we keep talking about tap capital gains. You know, if it, if it comes to the situation that we sell them just because we have enough debt for the squad right now in their positions, then fair enough. We're making some great profit. It looks great on the books. But there's always a buyback option as well. It's that little safeguard of security. Um, so some really good moves in sort of fleshing out the squad. Maldini's done a good job. It just needs to come down to signing some players. And obviously there's three that we consistently keep being linked with. Uh, CDK. Look, the latest updates on CDK from when the point of me making this video, we're going from different transfer fees. It sounds like it's it should be close to being done, maybe next week with the medicals, around 30 to 35 million euros. There might be an incorporation of the players, uh, the youth team goalkeeper, for example. Uh, you know, I'm hoping that just gets done. We really need to get a player through the door and he looks like the closest one. Renato Sanchez, frustrating from what we're hearing so far is that Renato, the deal we have with Lille, it's fine. You know, they're happy with the transfer fee that we've locked in. It's the highest one they've ever received. The PSG rumors are squashed. Um, but Mendes, his agent, same as Liao, is holding out for a higher salary, which might come from PSG, despite the fact they're not even putting in a serious bid. So that's another sort of frustrating one. And the last one is Hakim Ziyech, which I think is the sort of the bottom of the priority list when in a sense of, even though I put him as a top priority, I would, Ziyech for me is the player I feel like would give us the biggest upgrade, especially on that right side. We're sort of focusing on CDK so much that I think we can't really sort of, uh, you know, uh, sort of t do two things at once, basically, and sort of go for Ziyech at the same time. So once we hopefully get CDK sorted, we can then speak to Chelsea on the uh, the negotiations with his salary or the formula of the deal. Um, it just seems that right now it's kind of like 50-50 if that's actually going to happen. So the closest one we're really going to get is CDK right now. So hoping within the next week we just we need to get someone through the door because we need that bang in the market. 
quick outfit change, and there's a reason for it, not because I'm trying to practice me on Miami Vice, not because I'm trying to be AJ. I'm gonna quickly show you the two tops. Uh, hold them up so I can give you a bit more of a zoomed in perspective as well. The top from two seasons ago is the last time top I bought, a replica one compared to the authentic one from this season which I bought, which came in last week. Um, quickly, I'm gonna go through the replica one from two seasons ago because I just want us to be aware of the design choices when it comes down to it because there has been some stuff coming out about people a bit peed off about the materials used on the new authentic top. Um, quite surprised of, of, of the paper-like material um, and shocked that this is this top is worth this much amount of money, which is a debate for another story because that's just like, you go down the biggest sort of like wormhole in that regards. Firstly, let's look at the replica top. Traditional sort of um, fabric design with like polyester, feels much more like cloth compared to sort of this new paper-like design on the authentic top. Um, I don't, I don't actually remember what, how the Authentic one was made this season, but it certainly wasn't with this sort of new ultra weave technology that they're using on our tops for the Authentic one this season. Um, look, traditional design, it feels nice, it feels heavier. That's one thing I'm gonna say compared to the Authentic new top. Um, and yeah, stitching on the sort of the Puma logo, stitching on the AC Milan crest. The rest of it is iron pressed on, and if you've got printed on the back as well, it'll be iron pressed on too. That's the traditional replica top. Um, if I will say something before I show you sort of a zoomed in perspective with the authentic top is, if you're used to that, buy the replica top for this season. Do not buy the authentic one. Replica tops are made for fans. Authentic ones are made if you want that player feel, see what they experience when they play the tops. And and, and you need to understand this as well. Players traditionally don't wear, you know, it's not as if they wear the top for the game and it goes into the wash and they wear it next game. It gets discarded away. It's made as a sort of one-time use so just be aware of that before you make this purchase because it is gonna mean that when you come down to washing it, wearing it in certain instances, you need to be aware that the material just might not be as uh, you know rigid as the traditional replica one, which is kind of weird because the replica one is cheaper, 40 pounds cheaper, and I'm not quite sure the um, how it converts in different currencies, but it's gonna be cheaper than the traditional authentic one. But anyway, let's quickly go down to the authentic one. This is this new season's authentic one. I really love the design, I love the kit. Um, from the outside looking in, Looks lovely, honestly. People are quite annoyed with this sort of ultra weave technology, this paper-like feel. Um, it's quite hard to kind of get that off into a screen, but that's how it is. Um, it feels really thin, which has got benefits, pros and cons. Um, the pros being it's lightweight, you won't really feel the heat so much, you won't be sweating so much in it. Um, yeah, the cons is that maybe it's just a bit of a, an eyesore when you really look in. It's a complete contrast to the replica kit. If you see the sides and how the stitching is done, I mean, someone mentioned this online, uh, trying to get that out there. It's it's not ideal to look at because it looks like two pieces of paper like stapled together or something. And it kind of makes the, the product look a bit trash. But this is how it's done. There's obviously some science into this. Is it overpriced for what it is? I would say so, but so is everything. You know, you buy night trainers, you buy normal kits etc i usually wait for them to go on sale when i buy them because they're not worth what they what you pay for but especially if you're paying you know uh, with delivery charges in around 140 pound for this whole purchase plus the printing on the back is it worth what it is no it's not but at the same time this is if you want to buy it then buy it i've bought it it's for my birthday but i bought it and i like it i love it i'll rock it i just got to be very careful when it comes down to it talk about the iron press uh, puma logo the iron press milan logo um this is a, I think they stopped doing the sort of the uh, the Scudetto patch being stitched on as well. So this is all completely iron pressed on the front, plus Ibrahimovic iron pressed on the back as well, like normal kits would be as well. I love the cuff around the side. I love this sort of um, this sleeve collar, the uh, Tricolore, really nice. I like it. All I'm just going to say is, let me wrap things up about this whole kit thing. Buy the replica one because they're made for fans. It's that simple. So don't, so you're not disappointed that when your authentic comes up and you're not used to this new ultra weave material. I'm just sort of, my only pet, fee, pet peeve <laughs> would be, was when they did the pre-release, the authentic one was the only one available on pre-release. They didn't have the replica one available. If I had the option, not even in sort of in hindsight, even if I had the option, I would have picked replica all day because I always pick replica. But I got excited. I went for the authentic one. I thought, treat myself. I'm not disappointed with it. You know, there was that Twitter post um, quite annoyed with the materials being used, rightfully so, he's not used to it. But at the same time, I just wanna make fans aware before you make this purchase, what you're getting yourself into. Pick replica, it's the safe, safest option. I'm still gonna rock this, you'll still see me wearing it all throughout next season and beyond. 
if it stays intact. <laughs> so that's it guys, just hopefully giving you guys a heads up before you make that expensive purchase. So until next time guys, Forza Milan.